हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. Listen to the conversation between John, who is an accommodation officer for overseas students, and Susan, a Canadian student who wants an apartment and complete the form. Look at questions 1 to Hi, Students Housing Office. I'm John. Can I help you? Hi. I hope so. I need an apartment. The sooner the better. My friends suggested I try you guys. Well, that's what we're here for. The famous Students Housing Office. By the way, we call apartments flats here. Anyway, let's get started. First, I'll take down a few particulars to put in our database. Hopefully, we'll help you find some digs before term starts. Some what? Some digs. That's British slang for rented accommodation. Oh dear, flats, digs, and I'm an English major. No problem. But back to business. Okay, family name. Cartier. Cartier. Sounds French. Yeah, my ancestors were French. Wow. Do you speak French? I was born and raised in Montreal, so I'm bilingual. That's great. And your given names? Susan Marie. That's M A R I E. Got it. Nationality? Canadian, I guess. Right. And your student number? C A O four six two eight. Okay. Got a contact number? It's six five three four nine zero eight seven. I'm staying with friends until I find a place of my own. Six five three four nine one eight seven. No, nine zero eight seven. Got it. What about a mobile phone? I'll get one later today and tell you the number. Okay, six five three. That's way over the other side of town, right? Yes, near the railway station. Far too far if I have classes every day. So you want somewhere closer? Up to half an hour by bike, and with a bus service if the weather is too bad. Yeah, I cycle here too. Keeps me fit and no hassle trying to find a parking space. Do you want to share accommodation or live on your own? Live alone. I'll be too busy with my studies to bother with roommates. How much rent do you want to pay? Around five hundred pounds a month. Look at questions six to ten. Now listen to more of the conversation between John and Susan, and answer questions six to ten. That's about right, but it won't be very big. Would a bed sitter be okay? A bed sitter? More British English for you. It's a single room with cooking facilities. Some are quite nice. That'll be okay, but I don't want to share a bathroom, and it must be clean, bright, and not by a noisy main road. Okay, but you've come a bit late. With only four days to go before the term starts, we've only got shared accommodation on our files at the moment. But don't worry, we'll do our best. Oh, I forgot. Does the rent here include utilities? 
Usually, no. You have to pay the gas, electricity, and water yourself. What about a deposit? Most landlords want three months in advance, which is also a security deposit. And make sure you read the rental contract carefully, especially the small print. Thanks. I'll do that. Anything else you need to know? Not at the moment. Make sure you let me know your mobile phone number. Will do. Anyway, I must go now. I'm meeting some friends in the cafeteria. Okay, we'll be in touch. Bye for now. See you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You are going to hear an introduction to a library by George Martin, who is the head librarian. First, look at questions eleven to sixteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, and welcome to the main library of the University of British Columbia. My name is George Martin, and I'm the head librarian. And happy to give you a brief introduction to our library. I guess I'm qualified. I've been working here since 1961, back in the days when the only electrical or electronic stuff here was the lights. Oh, and the phones, of course. Mechanical typewriters and slide rules, then. No fancy laptops and cell phones. Computers? In a library? No way. Everything was on paper. If you needed to find something, you went to the card index. And if that didn't help, you asked one of the staff. And if that didn't work, you told your professor that you couldn't write the essay because the library didn't have the book you needed. My, you students have it so easy nowadays. We've got about 15 computer terminals on each of our four floors. If you know the title or the author, then you can find out if we've got it in seconds, and, if we do, where it is. If we haven't got it, then you can find out if the public libraries and other university libraries in Vancouver and Barnaby have it. Now you know that library books are arranged according to the numbers on the back of each book. Does anyone know the name of this numbering system? Right, the Dewey Decimal Classification System, which was invented by Melville Dewey, an American librarian, not John Dewey, the philosopher. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. In Melville's day, book classification systems were in a real mess, so he decided to do something about it, and around 1876 came up with the system we still use today. Look up there, and you can see a list of basic categories. 000, generalities, which includes all sorts of things, encyclopedias, news media, etc., etc. Then a hundred, philosophy and psychology. Two hundred, religion. Three hundred, social sciences. And so on, up to nine hundred, geography and history. With over four million books, actually nearer to five million now in our library, we have a lot to thank Melville for. 
Now, if you look up to your right, you can see the layout of the library. It's very logical. We start down here on the first floor, or the ground floor for our British cousins, with three zeros, generalities, and so on up to the fourth floor with all the 800s and 900s. By the way, you won't find books on medicine and dentistry here. They're all over in the me medical library, just to the east of the medical school. Now, if you look at the plan of the second floor, you can see we have a CD and DVD library. The music collection covers just about everything that we call serious, from Bach and Beethoven, folk music, blues, early rock and roll, jazz and more. But sorry, no punk, heavy metal, rap or hip-hop yet. For Oriental music, like Peking Opera, you'll have to go to the Asian Studies Centre, or Chinatown. A word about taking books out. The usual lending period is two weeks, but a few books in great demand can only be taken out for two days. And I suggest you try to return books on time. The fine is a dollar a day for the first week, and a dollar a day thereafter. That's a lot of beer money. One last thing. Your fancy new smart student card is also your library card, and you can also use it to pay at the student cafeteria. So don't lose it, or you'll starve to death without any library books. OK, I guess that's enough here. Let's move up to the second floor. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two students and their tutor discussing a survey project. First, you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. So, what's the survey about, Tom? It's about where students want to live and how they choose. Basically, their accommodation preferences. We've actually tried it out with a few students already. OK, that sounds fine. So, to start with, how many questions have you got? Hmm, 20? Is that too many? Yes, it is, really. People get fed up answering lots of questions and they stop thinking about their answers. Right, so we need to think about that again. What do you think of the first three questions? Uh, you want to know what affects students' choice of accommodation when they go to university? Yes. We want to find out which has the most effect. The cost, the number of rooms in the house or flat, or the distance from campus. And then we asked another question. Oh, yes. What else did you want to find out? Well, we wondered whether public transport was important. You know, not many students have cars, so it might be quite important for them to be near somewhere where they could catch a bus or train. Yeah, that's a good question. Before you ask any more people, I've got a couple of suggestions for improving the questionnaire. First of all, I think you need to ask fewer questions. As I said, 20 is really too many. I'd cut it down to 10 if I were you. OK, 10 questions only. And is there anything else you think we should do? Well, yes. Some of the questions are actually quite complicated. I think you should make them clearer. I mean, I think they should be easier to understand. And what do you think about asking more questions about cost? No, I don't think you need any more about cost. But you could ask a couple more questions about the reasons for students' decisions. So we should ask some more questions with why? Yes, I think you'd get quite a lot more information if you did that. Thank you. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, 
You have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Um, we've already got some results from our first questionnaire. Do you think we could use them? I don't see why not. What have you found out so far? Well, the number of rooms was only important for 16% of the people we asked. It looks like a lot of students are quite happy to share a room. And even fewer people were concerned about being near a bus stop. Uh, only 10%, in fact. I'm surprised about that. But what about the distance from the university? Well, that was quite important. Around 20% of the students we asked wanted to be close to campus. Hmm, that makes sense. And what about the cost? <laughs> yeah, as we expected, the cost was by far the most important factor. More than half the students were concerned with the cost, 54% to be exact. Only 54%? I thought it would be closer to 80%. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is, how birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food, and two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact, these reasons are closely linked. As you can imagine, when birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young. And in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young. And then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter, they fly back to warmer climates in the south. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures. But unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Now, I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration. Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. 
It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies, and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an Arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe, from the North Pole to the South. The Arctic tern travels between 12 and 15,000 kilometres each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing. Right, and lastly, I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular, but is very interesting. And this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line, as we might think. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you got guesswork. Please guys, participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.